In today's video, we are going to be discussing and exploring what the heck is going on in your child's brain or your teen or even your brain when you're feeling anxious. What causes this? So we are going to discuss the certain areas of the brain that are targeted, like what lights up essentially when you feel anxious, how that works with the nervous system. And then we're also going to be talking about the two branches of the nervous system, the four pathways an anxious brain can take. And lastly, we're going to talk about ways you can explain anxiety and the brain to a child as young as five years old. So please stay tuned for that at the very end of this video. And for all of you who don't know me, my name is Tammy Schmoon, and I'm a registered psychologist with the Institute of Child Psychology, and I'm also the co-host of the Child Psych Podcast. Okay, so if this video is helpful for you, feel free to explore our other videos we have on anxiety and hit subscribe to our YouTube channel. So let's take a look at this lovely model I have here of the brain. Okay. Now, when something happens in the environment, and it could be something seemingly uh, innocuous, like the child gets the wrong color of cup, or so they're really upset that something didn't go the way they thought it was going to go. So the parent's um, response was not predictable. Maybe your teenager has to give a speech in class. So that is something that's really scary to them. Um, maybe something happened a couple nights ago before bed. Maybe there's a big thunderstorm and your child's worried that a tornado is going to come and blow the house down. Now, anxiety can be about real things that could actually hurt us, or they can seem like really small things that don't make a lot of sense to adults. But understand what happens in your child's nervous system and their brain is real. So we don't want to minimize that. So whatever happens, we, our nervous systems collect information from the environment. So whether it's what we're, you know, someone told us something, we're thinking about something that's about to happen or did happen. We smell something. Um, it's an interaction with another human being. And anyway, our brainstem kind of collects this data of what's going on within our bodies and our thoughts impact our bodies or something has triggered a certain thought or something from the outside. And then we have this feeling that exists in our nervous system. So this first happens in your brain stem. It's at the base of the brain. So I call that your body brain. So when you're really anxious, you have things like your tummy turns, you know, your pupils dilate, you, we get all of the, our heart races, we, our respiration rate increases. And what's happening is our body is preparing for stress. So this kind of happens first in, in our brain stem, so our body brain. And then what happens next is we are amygdala. This is a part of the brain that exists in the center of our brain. It's this little almond shaped cluster. And think of that as the smoke detector of your brain. The amygdala, so if here's our brain, so our, I think if we open it up, we have our amygdala would be right about here. That's your amygdala. Now your amygdala is going to gather information from that brainstem and say, hmm, is there a problem? And it goes next door. There's this other, if we use uh, Dr. Dan Siegel's model of the brain ham model, we make this the base of our brain, our body brain. And this is our feelings brain, our limbic system. It's our emotional brain. It's our midbrain. Um, and this knuckle is your, is your smoke detector, your amygdala. And next door to it is a, a piece called the hippocampus. So the hippocampus stores memories. So when your amygdala gets this information from the base of the brain, it says, hmm, hey, hippocampus, is there a memory in there that would indicate this sound, this thought, this circumstance, um, you know, anything that is happening in inside my body or out here or a thought I'm having, which then creates a sensation in my body is a problem. And if the hippocampus is like, absolutely, this happened last week, or you had a sleepover and it ended really poorly, or you gave a speech three years ago and everyone laughed, like if there's a memory in there that amygdala is like, got it there's a problem. So when this amygdala right here in the center of your brain fires and it's in charge of emotion and then the hippocampus next door is in charge of memory, the smoke alarm goes off. Now, if any of you have had a smoke alarm go off in your house, you know that sometimes the smoke detector goes off when there's burnt toast. So our kids and we can have these false alarms in our brain, meaning that something is that, that we think might hurt us. And we'll talk about the part of the brain that's responsible for those lovely thoughts. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. Just because something uh, is possible doesn't mean it's probable. And the brain has that amygdala has a really hard time judging that. 
it's just plays it safe. That amygdala tends to, and the more of a sensitive person we are, the more adversity we had in our childhood, the more likely that alarm is gonna go off in your brain or your child's brain. And some people just have that sensitivity. I highly encourage you to look at highly, the highly sensitive person, highly sensitive children, again, or if you have a child um, who has had a lot of adversity, trauma, separation, those kinds of things. They're gonna be more wired for this alarm to go off more easily. And some people, it's actually just genetic that we come into this world that way, that we just have that sensitivity. So that doesn't mean anything's wrong with you. It's just some people are that way more than others. So if that amygdala, even if it's a false alarm, and sometimes it's a real alarm, but a lot of times with anxiety, it's a false alarm, it goes off, it's to keep the child safe because the brain's number one job for a child or an adult, a teenager, a senior citizen, it is to keep us alive. We've got to do that before we can do all this really logical stuff and self-soothing and all that. The brain first has to make sure that what's going on isn't a real fire. So the amygdala sounds in the troops because it's saying like it might be making a mistake, but it went next door to that hippocampus. And for some reason, there was a memory or something that had happened in there that maybe was a little bit similar. So if the amygdala fires, what's going to happen is it engages what's called the sympathetic nervous system, which is the gas pedal of the brakes. The opposite is your parasympathetic nervous system, which we will talk about in another video. Parasympathetic is like the brakes of your brain. And that's what we really want as parents working with an anxious child is we want to engage parasympathetic. But what's happening is you have sympathetic. So the gas is going. So we have adrenaline and cortisol being released in the body. And then the brain takes four pathways. So now we're in, I guess, the main highway is your sympathetic nervous system. So highway, now you have four pathways you can take, four exits off the highway. Those exits are as follows. We have fight, flight, freeze, or collapse, okay? So now the collapse is a, it's a dissociative response. So it's not super common um, unless you've had anxiety for a really, really long time or you have a lot of trauma. So we're gonna focus, I'll mention it a little more and go into it, but the, the three pathways you're probably focusing on the most with kiddos who are anxious or teens is your fight, flight, freeze. So think of it as fight is when kids get combative and they're argumentative and they can get aggressive. Like anxious kids can fight you, they can argue, um, they can get physical in their tantrums. And so that's a fight response. And if you think about it, if we're getting attacked by a predator because we, you know, we're in, for thousands and thousands of years, we lived outdoors. This, this response is very primal. So we've got this fight response within us and every kid is different in which pathway they take. There is, you know, some kids are, are fighters, some are avoiders, some are freezers. That next step is if we needed to run away from, you know, to fight, there's fighting off the predator and then there's looking for the nearest exit. Imagine there was an avalanche or a forest fire. That's the flight response. That's why kids who are anxious avoid. A lot of them don't, you know, they, they want to hide in their room. I'm not going to school. I don't want to play with that friend anymore. Like they don't want to do it. That's the flight response. And that again, makes sense. There is an avalanche. We need to get away. We don't want to be uh, crushed by imminent amounts of snow. The other pathway that is common is a freeze response where that child just is like mobilized. They will sometimes crumple on the floor. They're not going to do the things. So they don't leave. It's almost like they just can't speak. They can't talk. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll hide behind you. So that is that freeze response where they just don't even have the words. They just kind of stay there in like a statue. So that's your freeze. And that makes sense if you are in, in nature and you're freezing to look for the nearest exit and you don't want to expel a bunch of energy taking the wrong route. So our body freezes trying to make a decision about what should happen. What do I do next? So that's your freeze response with, uh, with kiddos and, and adults. And then the last response is your dissociative response, which is where you've been anxious for a really, really long time. And what happens is you go into a, a collapse state where you actually go into parasympathetic in an unhealthy way. Your body actually starts to shut down physically and, and emotionally, and we lose track of time and we stop time stamping memories. Many of us have experienced driving to work and we don't remember getting there. That's mild dissociation or we're really overwhelmed and we go on Netflix to kind of just check out and we binge watch some TV or we eat sometimes this really unhealthy food. That's all numbing out. That is a dissociative response. But typically when we're talking about anxiety, we're talking about fight, flight, or freeze. Those are usually the four uh, sympathetic pathways. 
that we take on that particular highway of anxiety. So we can tell kids that and we can talk to them about like how in mother nature, that is how we survived for hundreds of thousands of years. We had these three responses. So the other thing to understand is when your kiddo is amygdala is firing. So this amygdala has gone off and the smoke detector has gone off. What Dr. Dan Siegel and Dr. Tina St. Bryson talk about in a lot of their books is this idea of flipping your lid. And I will give you a script for that here in a second. And the idea is when our amygdala fires and we go into fight, flight, freeze, we lose not entirely. Let me be clear, because I'll talk about one other part of the brain, but we lose connectivity to a majority of the of, of logic in our executive function, our logical brain, our prefrontal cortex, our cortical brain. So we've got this here. This is your cortical brain up here, right in the front, because this is like the brain. This is the front. This is the back. So here. So during an anxious moment, it's really difficult for your child to access language and logic. And even that logic that is there, so the, I should say logic, the language that is there, the thoughts that are there, because it's not like you don't have thoughts when you're anxious. You have really negative thoughts. The brain has something called, the amygdala works with another part of the brain up here, actually. This is why I say you don't lose complete connectivity to your logical brain, your language centers, the anterior cingulate cortex. And the anterior cingulate cortex, or ACT, is involved with negative thinking and so it's like a magnifier for what ifs this could happen and this could happen and it's solely based on what are the possible bad things that could happen and that is why people who are anxious have so many of these black or white thoughts it's all or nothing it's catastrophizing it, it's not looking at probability it's looking specifically at all the possibility it's, it's just simply because the brain is trying to keep us safe so when somebody has their amygdala fire and they're anxious, I know Dr. Dan Siegel and Dr. Tina Prime Bryson say you flip your lid. And that's why what that means is kids are impulsive. That logical brain that's now offline for the most part, minus your, you know, your ACT uh, that's in charge of negative thinking. It means that we are dysregulated. We lose connection with the ability to calm our body. And so we can tell kids that, you know, what happens is our body brain, sends a signal, collects information, like all this stuff happens out, out there. And our amygdala says, I smell smoke. Is this a fire? And if the brain thinks it might be a fire, even just a slight chance, we go into um, something called anxiety. It's fear because our brain thinks something bad might happen. And so when that amygdala goes off, the smoke detector goes off, we flip our lid, which means our thinking brain goes offline. That's what you have to tell kids. And this amygdala is just trying to keep you safe. So it makes you want to, sometimes you want to argue, sometimes you want to hide or run away, and sometimes you can't even move. And your body and your brain is simply trying to keep you safe in case something bad happens. And so that's a really simple way just to explain it to kids because sometimes when they're anxious, they say bad things, they do things that they normally wouldn't do. Um, their thoughts can be very disturbing to them. And so that's why we can tell kids that, you know, when our amygdala, and you don't have to explain the anterior cingulate cortex, but we can just say that the amygdala will say things that aren't true because it's actually trying to keep you safe because it thinks the sleepover or giving the speech in class or going to swimming lessons or whatever it is they're scared of is something that's going to physically harm them. And it, it's going to end really poorly for them when in fact, maybe that thing's not as bad as we think it is. So that is anxiety in the brain in a nutshell. It's all about safety. The brain is just trying to keep them safe. And one of the things I want to leave you with here is this amygdala here. One of the best things it does is it speaks in love and connection. So the brain stem, your body brain always speaks in physical safety. Am I physically safe? This part of the brain, your limbic system, where your amygdala hangs out, where that smoke detector hangs out is all about love, connection, and safety. And that is why kids need you when they're anxious. It doesn't mean we let them avoid hard things. It just means that making sure that that child feels that their anxiety, that you acknowledge their anxiety is a real thing, that you understand it's fear, that they feel fear, that their body feels yucky, and you believe them. That is a really important part. And then, you know, the next parts are obviously not letting our kids avoid hard things, but that is a whole nother video in itself. So this is just to describe 
you know, what anxiety looks like in that nervous system. And it is all about safety and self-preservation.